And now I get to get up here and preach about the book of Judges. <laughs> if you'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we just thank you and praise you that your spirit is in this place. Lord, we thank you for the blessing and heritage that you give us of, of family and friends, Lord, that not only that we have whatever immediate family we have in this world, but that you give us brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Wherever we're at, Lord, we know we're united together. Lord, we're united, united not only with this church body, with, it, with every believer, Lord. Help us to be the kind of believers that realize that and live as though we are not citizens of this world, but citizens of heaven. And help us along for the day when we do meet our glorious Savior face to face. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm not kidding. I'm going to preach on Judges. Because I got to, because otherwise you got too many questions about it. So we'll kind of go over some of those things and ask those things. If you don't have questions, you didn't read it, period. <laughs> so you should have read um, this week Judges 9 through 21. You should have read Lamentations and John chapters 4 through 6. Before I start into Judges, I want to remind you the time of Judges is after the time that um, the Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, out of captivity and slavery, slavery, but they longingly looked back and continually tried the patience of our Lord, our God. But praise be to God that He is faithful and long-suffering and kind and merciful and loving. And they came into the promised land later, not the generation that left, but the next generation, and they did not do what the Lord said. They did not drive out the foreign idols from the land. And they intermarried and brought the pagan rituals and things right back into their life. But Joshua had given this warning because if you notice where our Bible is placed, it's Joshua, then Judges. Okay? At the end of Joshua, that's where I had Merle read from. And I'm going to read a little more there before we get into Judges. I'm going to start in Joshua chapter 24, verse 11. After this, you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. Maybe next week you need to sing that muddy river Jordan. Just putting that in your ear, okay? After this, you crossed Jordan and came to Jericho. The people of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And I delivered, you, delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet ahead of you, and it drove out the two Amorite kings before you but not by your own sword or by your own bow. So I gave you land on which you did not toil and cities that you did not build. And now you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Cast aside the gods of your fathers served before the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if it is unpleasing to you and your in your sight to serve the Lord, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua and Caleb were the two that served the Lord wholeheartedly and the only two out of the previous generation that entered into the promised land. Verse 16, the people replied, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and performed these great signs before your eyes. He protected us throughout our journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who live in the land. We too will serve the Lord because He is our God. And these words echo in John as we're reading because of the signs that Jesus did and the things that claims that Jesus made. Even to the point where we get to John 6 where he asks who the disciples believe they are and Peter cries out and says, You're the Messiah. Where are we going to go? You have the words of life. Verse 18, And the Lord drove out before us all the nation, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because He is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You're not able to serve the Lord. For He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, He will turn and bring disaster on you and consume you, even after He has been good to you. No, the people replied, We will serve the Lord. Then Joshua told them, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. We are witnesses, they said. Now therefore, he said, Get rid of the foreign gods among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. 
So the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey his voice. On that day Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem he established for them a statue, a statue and ordinance. Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was near the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, You see this stone? It will be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words the Lord has spoken to us, and it will be a witness against you if you ever deny your God. Then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. I wanted to read that first because I wanted to set the stage of the, of the judges and how God was still with Israel in such a chaotic time as the judges. When if you read Judges, you saw the pattern there. The pattern was they did whatever seemed right to them, not to the Lord. They didn't take their salvation seriously. And I say that again because that's the case of so many in the church today. They're saved. They've got the grace of God. Jesus loves. How can He bring about His justice anymore on me so I'll live however I want to? What a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What a dreadful thing to mock the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the great gift of salvation that He has given us. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for the day is the day of your salvation. Take your salvation seriously. In Judges chapter 8, the end of verse 28, during Gideon's, Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. Jerob, Jerob Baal, Huh, that's Gideon. Did you catch it? Changed his name here. So we got to think about why this name change and stuff. But this name change isn't so good in the Bible. Because Gideon started off with faith, but then he kind of walked away. It means let, let Baal contend or fight. Because Gideon's father had tore down Baal's altar. And he said, your life will be a continued fight. But yet victory is in the Lord, isn't it? Victory is in Jesus. But so many times we try to fight the battle alone and try to do it ourselves and forget that the victory is already in Jesus. We just need to fix our eyes on Him and walk in, in the step with the Spirit. He's the son of Joash. He went back home to live and he had 70 sons and had many wives. Wow! He was a busy man. No wonder he didn't have time for anything else. His concubine who lived in Shechem also bore him a son whom he named Abimelech. Wow! So I guess that's 71. I did my math wrong. Was it 71? Because yes. he's 70 plus 1. Because we're going to get to that in a minute. I've got to change my math because of how many he kills. Okay? Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father, Joash, in, in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. Wow. Judges chapter 9, Abimelech along with the people of Shechem, did what was right in his eyes. If I'm going to be king, i got to get rid of my 69 other bro 70 brothers, but I'm only going to kill 69. 69 of his half-brothers, however you want to put it, he kills with, along with the people. How can that seem right in anybody's eyes? Oh, but wait, wait, before we judge and condemn and point fingers. Looking back in your life, when you did this or that, how did it seem right in your eyes? If you don't have something, i got plenty I can tell you, but I'll keep it to myself. And they weren't when I was a heathen. They were when I wasn't walking in step with the Spirit, when I was saved, a child of God, but did things right in my own eyes. I don't think I'd ever go that far, but boy, when you head down that path, it doesn't take long to find out how did I ever get this far. Only one son escapes. Judges chapter 9 verse 19. So have you acted honorably and in good faith towards Jeroboam, Baal, I don't know how to pronounce it, and his family today? If you have, may Abimelech be your joy and may, may you be his too. Verse 20. But if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you and the citizens of Shechem and Beth Melo. And let fire come out from you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. This was the judgment that the only living child pronounced. Wow. 
Gideon, a man who went out and saw God's glory by only fighting with 300 men. He saw the fact that we should break those clay jars to let our light shine. And then this is his heritage, his blessing. This is how his children behave. What if we took seriously again our salvation and wrote God's laws on the doorposts of our houses? Because they should be written on the doorposts of our hearts. We've been given a new heart, a heart of flesh. Do you know what that means when Ezekiel said that? Don't get that confused with flesh versus other things. Flesh is soft and pliable, something that can be molded and made. The Spirit will give you a new heart of flesh so that the Spirit can use you rather than a heart of stone that you can't do anything with. So write God's words on your doorpost. Talk about them when you get up. Talk about them when you sit down to eat. Talk about them when you go about. Talk about them when you sit down to eat again. Talk about them when you go to bed. But why did it take so long? Verse 22, after Abimelech had governed Israel three years, then God did something. Oh, how many times have you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, but God didn't answer in your timing? Did you stop praying? Don't tell me many times you didn't. Did your prayers cease a little bit? Did you get discouraged? God's timing is not your timing. Pray fervently. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. You keep praying and praying and praying and praying. I guarantee you there's plenty of people out there when you talk to people and they comfort you because they've received comfort from God, they'll understand that they prayed for somebody, especially a grandmother that prayed for a grandchild all of her life. And then in her dying, she saw them come to Jesus or whatever it was. Continue to pray. Continue to praise and thank God for your salvation. Continue to work it out with fear and trembling. God stirred up animosity between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem. Don't let that look like that's a bad thing. God just stirred up, up us in us the evil desires that were already there. Because we turned from God. He didn't do anything and He didn't make us act on anything. He doesn't tempt, Scripture says. And there's no temptation out there that we cannot bear. <clears throat> But he stirred up animosity so that, so that they acted treacherously against Abimelech. God, this, God did this in order that the crime against Jeroboam's 70 sons, the shedding of their blood, might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and on the citizens of Shechem who had helped him murder his brothers. How could that seem right in the eyes of anybody? Oh, but how could some of the things that we see happen in our world today, in our own lives and in our government and everything else, <laughs> how could they seem right in the eyes of anyone, let alone in the eyes of the Lord? The town's men fought against Abimelech's men. They fought back and forth and they killed each other. Judges chapter 10, we see some more judges come up. Tola, Jer, and then Jephthah. We don't know anything much about Tola or Jer, but we got Jephthah, so let's look at him a, a minute. Judges chapter 10, verse 8. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ash Ashtoreths, and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. Wow! That's a lot of different religious cultures, gods there. But how many idols and gods do you have in your life that you don't realize unless you sit down? Well, actually, let's get on our knees or prostrate ourselves before the Lord and ask Him to examine our hearts. How many things do we put our trust in? Good things, even our family and our health. But we put our trust in them more than we do in God. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served Him... He became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistine and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. Thank goodness Jesus was not even recognizable as a human being. He was crushed by God's wrath for our sins. But the Israelites cry out, and God answers because He's faithful. He, he sends a judge. Judge chapter 11, Jephthah the, the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Huh. Okay. So his brothers, as a result of this, this wouldn't have happened otherwise, potentially, they chased him away from his home. Look at this that we have in our family because we haven't wrote God's laws on our heart and therefore hadn't wrote them on the doorposts of our home. 
and we haven't talked about him. We professed him with our lips, but our hearts were far from him. We said, do this, son. Don't follow my actions, though. But later they needed this mighty warrior, and Jephthah engaged the Ammonites. But he also made a vow. Did you catch that? He vowed to God, and he made a foolish vow. Verse 29 of chapter 11, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, If you give the Ammonites into my hands whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph, from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. God gave him the victory. What or who came out of his house? His only daughter, his only child. Oh, what about a foolish vow? Lord, while I'm praying, if you'll only do this, if you'll only do this for me, if you'll only fix my marriage, that's a good thing, right? I'll do this. Don't make a foolish vow to God. Serve the Lord your God. <laughs> Pray. Depend on Him. Well, what happened to Jephthah's daughter? That's a controversy. At least it is in our minds. Because how could the God allow that to happen? How can God allow sinful things to happen in this world? Because we chose to sin and He gives us a choice and that one day we will be judged for everything. And if we aren't profound innocent because of the blood of Jesus Christ, then we will spend an eternity apart from Him. But if we are found forgiven, redeemed, justified, sanctified, then we will be saved and brought into His presence not because of our righteous works. Instead, all of our heinous, unforgivable sins will be forgiven. So what happened? Well, we, we don't know for sure, but I'm going to go right here again. My thought process, you don't have to agree, is Jeff to sacrifice his daughter. Now, she was crying out if you read the scripture because she wasn't going to be able to bear children. But that was one of the greatest honors that she would have and now she wasn't going to be able to do that. So again, let's say I found out I have cancer today and I've got 10 days to live. I'm probably not going to cry out about the cancer as much as I'm going to cry about I'm not going to see my wife or my son or my grandchildren again. I think that's why she cried out. His vow was to sacrifice whatever and as, do it as a burnt offering. He knew a dog wasn't coming out to see him. He thought a human being was coming out to see him because that's who would come to greet. He just thought it might be a handmaid or something rather than his daughter. That's my thoughts. I'll say it again at the end of that so you know that. It's not important to the situation. The, the, the scripture here is that he made a foolish vow that he had to keep. Oh, be careful in what you say and do to get the God to respond to you because he cares about you regardless and he will give you everything that you need. So don't chase after the desires of this world. That's what you used to do before you were a new creation in Christ. Instead, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Instead, proclaim the sal sa salvation that you have through Jesus Christ. Judges chapter 12. The Ephraimite forces were called out. And they crossed over to Zaphron. They said to Jephthah, Why did you fight against the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We're going to burn down your house over your head. What? This story just keeps getting crazier. <laughs> I'm mad at you because you didn't call me out to fight, but you gave me victory. I'm your brother. I should have fought with you. Now I'm going to kill you. That makes no sense. But it doesn't make any sense the things you do. Remember the things you did? When you said, at first I'm going to go down this road, and then I wind up down this road, and then I'm way over here before I realize it, and I say, oh, I have sinned against my father. I'm lying in a puddle of mud with pigs. I need to go back to my father and ask forgiveness for him because I have sinned against him. What do you have to do when you realize that? Get up out of the mud and go back home. Praise be that we have a God that accepts you because you are His child if you are His child. And there's nothing that will ever change that. You are His child. Wow. 42,000 Israelites were killed. Wow. 
Judges chapter 13, there's Samson. Who do we remember most out of the book of Judges? Who do we teach our children about in Sunday school? Samson. Do you teach the right things about Samson? That's why I played you the video last week. He probably was a culmination, as we see this going up, of who disobeyed the Lord, period, throughout his life. Why? Because of his lust and his jealousy. But God used that to destroy the Philistines who were oppressing the Israelites because he heard the cry of the Israelites were being oppressed. And he used the evil that is in this world to bring about good. Wow, when you teach the Old Testament that way to somebody that doesn't understand the God of the Old Testament, maybe they can see a loving God who would then give his son to save them. But you've got to teach that story the right way. Or otherwise, Samson looks like this hero that he is. Let's not forget that. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 to 34. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever spent time studying that? That the author of Hebrews puts them in there? Oh, the scripture is divine, inspired by God. They're there. About David and Samuel. Okay, well, we've got a lot better, but okay. It's not about my righteousness again. It's not. That's why I said a few weeks back, it's not that Noah was a good man. It was that he found God's favor. Only one man. When we're down to just one, God still keeps his promise. And he will keep his promise to the whole world through the one man, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33, who through faith, okay, there we got it, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness, there we've got that weakness, was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. So why is Samson in there? I mean, either, some of the others even started out pretty good. But Sam, the, Samson, when he started out, he immediately started out going chasing women and got mad and started doing things to the Philistines as a result. Right? You did read it, right? I mean, his first encounter was, I'm going to go marry this girl. Tell me your secret to your strength. She tells them, and he leaves her behind, and his father gives the bride away. Then he finds out and goes back and says, I want to go back to her because she's hot, whatever it is, and goes back, finds out she's married, and gets mad, and he kills Philistines. Oh, I forgot he killed 30 Philistines before that to give the coats to them because they saw the riddle. Where's faith in that? Well, I'm going to tell you, you'll see it in Scripture if you read it. Because it says, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and the lion came out and was going to kill him, God gave him the faith to kill the lion. That's the only time I see it in Scripture. We don't have every event recorded, everything else. Have you checked that? Is it ready? Okay. Um, but he had faith there. I did find that in Scripture because I looked. <laughs> I'm looking, examining, examining the Word of God so that I can answer these things so that when we're, we're doing in Sunday school and you're welcome to come again, we haven't really started. We watched the movie last week. I can give you a copy if you want to see it this being able to give our testimony. And be careful when you, you do the Scripture. <laughs> I went to a free Methodist meeting yesterday and I tested some of the pastors there. Because I said, what does the, you know, the Great Commission say? Well, it says to go up and train disciples. Yeah, there's a battle plan first. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that it? Yeah, that's basically it. No, it ends with the last things and teach them to obey everything Jesus commanded so that you're not a hypocrite. You're not training up a disciple properly if you're not teaching them to obey everything, and they're not going to obey everything if they see that you're a hypocrite in the way that you live. And Peter tells us to revere Christ as Lord before we give that apology because others will see and come to us and do it with humility and respect. Don't forget those parts out of the verses. Hmm. We'll study Samson more later. We know what happened in the end. Kind of puzzling again. He asked the Lord for strength. They, had, they gouged his eyes out. He was standing in the temple. He asked the boy to take him over to the pillars that supported the temples, and he prayed for strength one more time. 
The way I read that, even with the long hair back, because it's not a thing, it's in God. God gave him the strength then to do what? To destroy the Philistines, and he destroyed more than he did in his lifetime. And they were honoring their gods and mocking him and mocking the God of Israel. But he died during the process. He took his own life. That's a little puzzling to a lot of people. Especially to some of the world thinks unpardonable sin would be taking your own life. That's not the unpardonable sin. And that's not just my opinion. <laughs> the unpardonable sin is rejecting salvation when it comes to you with the Holy Spirit. You don't know if you'll ever be given another chance. If today the Lord is calling you, today is the day of your salvation. And it works the same as if He's calling you to do something as a Christian, as the body of Christ. So am I done with the book of Judges yet? Oh, Well, I've got in Judges chapter 17, Micah. This is not the prophet Micah. Don't get confused. This is Micah who goes out, steals from his mother in the first place, gets idols, makes idols, and asks the Levite to come be his priest. Because if I have a personal priest, surely that's a lot better than just having a priest for all of Israel. I got my own. Well, we do through Jesus. That's different. But I don't know how you would come to that logic. I don't know how the Levite would come to that logic. He is a thief, an idolater. And he took the priest from the people to serve himself to make offerings to God on his behalf for his sins. Oh, if I'm saved, that's fine. But I don't care about no one else. Well, you know, that goes back to some Christians today. I'm saved and I know it but I don't go tell anybody else about it, then there's some question whether you're saved and you know it. Because otherwise you'd want to share that gift you have. It's too, too incredible not to share. Oh, Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. This is not leading up to the book of kings because we find out kings can't save us either. God, God brought Saul in and Saul turned his heart. Then we have David who is a man after God's own heart. But a king can't save you. But who would come from the lineage of David? The king of all kings and the Lord of all lords, Jesus Christ. He is the answer. You see how I am pointing the Old Testament to Jesus? And Jesus says that everything the Old Testament speaks about speaks of Him. He also said when He was asked to tell what the, the Old Testament meant... To so love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And if you do that, you can't help but love others as yourself. And there's no way you can love others as yourself if you don't know the love of God. So if you're not loving others, you probably don't know the love of God. Do you see this, pro uh, this problem? So are you a child of God and are you living as a child of God, loving God and loving others? Do we have any idols then? The answer is yes. <laughs> what are they? What do you need to do about them? Well, the answer is pretty clear there, what you need to do about them. Is Jesus your priest, your high priest? Has he paid the price? Has he called you to be a priest and a royal priesthood? I believe that's scriptural too. So you're out to go out offering spiritual sacrifices on behalf of others. Are you doing that? Are you building on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ? Are you zealous? Are you chasing out false doctrines so that they don't spread in your church and in other churches? Oh, there's plenty of false doctrines out there, and they certainly include Jesus in the false doctrines. Jesus is not a humble servant that's, that's a, the man of suffering in most, in most religious circles in the United States. He's a good prophet that offers salvation, however. But he's not the king of kings and lord of lords. And if you, profess with your, if you believe in your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord, then you know that you're saved. So in Judges chapter 18, they spread a false gospel, right? Everybody else wants the priest for themselves. <laughs> chapter 18, verse 1. In those days Israel had no king. Not talking about Saul, not talking about David. The tribe of Dan follow after Micah from Ephraim in this false worship. Not a worship that came from other lands, 
other gods, a, worship, a false worship that came from inside of God's children. Wow. I'm looking at the letters Paul wrote, the letters Peter wrote, the letters James wrote, the letter the author of Hebrews wrote. I'm going to say that's Barnabas in my opinion again. I just like that one. Because he, he needs a book in the Bible. Because he's cool. Because he's a son of encouragement. That's what the apostles called him. And he didn't consider anything his own when, when the church started and growing. He sold what he had and gave it to the apostles so there were no one in need. Wow, that is encouraging. But they figured that it would be good for them to take this priest and everything. So in Judge eight, Judges chapter 18, verse 27, the, then they took what Micah had made and, and his priests and went to Laish against, against a people at peace and secure. They attacked them with sword and burnt down their city. Why would you do that? Verse 30, There the Danites set up for themselves the idol, the, and Jonathan, son of Gershom, the Lephite, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity in the land. And none of them said what you're doing here is wrong? They continued to use the idol Micah had made. Judges chapter 19, Sooner or later, things have got to get better in this story, right? Okay. In those days, Israel had no king. That's how chapter 19 starts. Then it says, now Levite. Oh, he's going to do what's right, right? This, this is story. Certainly somebody stands up. One man's going to stand up. Uh, he does what's right. Uh, he gets a concubine. She leaves. He goes back and gets her, brings her back to town. The t town men want to have their way with him and instead the man in the house stands up a little bit but instead this Levite he throws his concubine out to the men and they rape her all night long to save his own skin what kind of priest is that oh wait a minute what kind of priest would I be if I'm not proclaiming Jesus Christ that should hit home, guys. What are you doing with the salvation that you have? Are you just living your own life content knowing that you're saved? Or are you trying to guide others across that Jordan River into the promised land? Judges chapter 19, verse 30. Everyone, oh, I got my head of myself. So what does he do? He, he goes home mad with his concubine. We don't know if she's dead or not. I don't know if you caught that from Scripture. She might have been dead. He might have killed her. Scripture does not say. Now, either way, it's terrible. But if he killed her, he didn't want anything to have to do with her anymore because of what it was, and he killed her. If she was dead already, he let her die. E either way, he cuts her up into 12 pieces and sends her out to the 12 tribes of Israel. Oh, this is going to get a reaction, but the reaction it gets still doesn't lead to, let's, what's the word? Repentance. It leads to anger, just like Samson. We've already had this story with Samson. We see it. They're not learning anything from these judges. And he sends it out to the 12 tribes, and they get upset. Verse 30, everyone who saw it was saying to one another, such a thing like this has never been seen or done. Not since the day the Israelites came out of Egypt. Never have we seen a, such a heinous thing as this since we were deep in the land of slavery in the foreign land and their gods. How could something like this happen in the United States? No, Israel. I almost said United States, didn't I? Just imagine we must do something, so speak up. Okay, let's see what they're going to do. Just chapter 20. Verse 18, the Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God, they said, Who of us is going up to fight against the Benjamites? Because that's, that's the tribe that did it. The Lord replied, Judah shall go first. Okay, we were seeking the Lord's guidance here. Okay, but where have you been all prior to this? What's God going to say and how's He going to use you? And are you saved? Or are you just Pharaoh who He's called time and time again to do this but didn't listen? Verse 19, the next morning the Israelites got up, pitched camp near, near Gibeah. The Israelites went out to fight the Benjamites and took the battle position against them at Gibeah. 
Verse 21, the Benjamites came out of Gibeah and cut down 22,000 Israelites on that battlefield that day. Wait a minute, God said go out and fight. He did, didn't he? He might have said my words again. <laughs> go ahead and fight, buddy. <laughs> See what happens. But the Israelites courage one another and again took up their position where they stationed themselves the first day. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord. This time we got a little bit more coming to the Lord. They wept until evening and they inquired of the Lord. They said, Shall we go up again to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites? The Lord answered, Go up against them. Reminds me of, I think, believe it's James when he says that they're sick among you because of the way you're living and everything. But you've also got to remember that Jesus said that bad things happened. This tower didn't fall on them because it just happened. But there are things in your life that do happen as a result of the things that you've done, period. And one of the things I'll ask you again, have you done, have you wrote down God's laws on your doorposts and do you talk about them when you get up and go about and when you come back? Have you done that with your children? Because if they're not following with the Lord, and I'm the first one to say it, I did not do it as much as I should. So now I've got to be that effective, fervent prayer that, that prays, that man that prays, and I've got to constantly build that art so that I hope that my son and my daughter and my grandchildren will come into that. Daughter-in-law, if you want me to put it that way so you don't get confused, I don't have a daughter out there anywhere. But I have a daughter-in-law and she's my daughter. But I pray for them and I build that art so that they'll come in because I know as a father I did a half-hearted job, not a whole-hearted job. And if we're all honest, we all did half-hearted jobs at times. But God can forgive us. He loves us. The Lord answered and told them to go up against them. Then the Israelites drew near to Benjamin the second day. This is verse 24. This time when the Benjamites came out from Gibeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18,000 Israelites, all of them who were armed with swords. Now all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. Oh, maybe that's why he let it happen too, to bring about true repentance. Maybe the ones that were left that day were the ones that would truly repent. God is sovereign. He won't let a hair on your head be harmed otherwise. Can you rationalize these things now with someone? I hope that helps. Verse 27, And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. In those days the ark of the covenant of God was there, with Phinehas son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. They asked, Shall we go up again to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites, or not? Brother against brother. And the Lord responded, Go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands, because he is going to avenge this. But first they had to make themselves right before the Lord, didn't they? At least you can get that point out of it. The battle rages on until the whole tribe of Benjamin is almost wiped out, though. Was that the God's will? There's only 600 men left out of this whole tribe. Now we've got a new problem. How's this tribe going to continue? Judges chapter 21, they say, what have we done? And we did it in the name of the Lord. Now I've got to go back and examine myself again. Those times that I did this, that I was over here instead of being over here, that I said, I'm doing this in the name of the Lord. Oh, no, I wasn't, as I had hypocrisy. and I wasn't going talking to that person in the name of the Lord. I wanted to do whatever, whatever the circumstance is. Verse 1, the men of Israel had taken an oath at Misphan. Oh, there's another careless oath. Not one of us will give his daughter in marriage to a Benjamite. Be careful with those careless oaths. Then they sought the Lord with lip service, right? Verse 10, So the assembly sent, 20, sent 12,000 fighting men with instructions to go to Jabez Gilead and put the sword to those living there, including women and children. What? Let's go to another innocent town. Let's kill the men and, women, the men and children. Uh, women and children. That's what you're going to do. But keep the virgins. Kill every male and every woman who is not a virgin. And you're going to give the virgins away. You're going to wipe out this community to give the virgins to, this, to the Benjamites so they can travel on. Guess what? The numbers didn't match, did they? We thought that plan would work, but we're short. We need another 200 men, but we've made a vow. We can't do it. So they say, you guys just go steal them from us on the way to, to celebrate God. 
No wonder we had to read the book of Lamentations, right? <laughs> A crying out to God. The end of Judges chapter 1 says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Please examine your hearts and the things that you do. It ought to be daily to see if what you did was fit in your own eyes or if it was right in God's eyes. Because it's so easy to fool yourself. And Satan's constantly there, constantly trying to distract you. I'm going to read it again this week, and I probably will read it again for several weeks. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, even in the time of these judges. And in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Verse 3, though, says, that's why Paul says, I put no stumbling block. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry cannot be discredited. What if he went out there and preached one thing but lived a different way? His ministry would be discredited. How about your ministry? Hebrews also tells us, I read from there earlier, if you finish that Hall of Faith chapter in verse 39 of 11, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they made him perfect, would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. How? For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. John chapter 4. What happened? Jesus sees a, an advantage. Well, what happened in chapter 3? Well, he, uh, chapter 2 even, chapter 1. You've you got to have this flow. The light came into the world. There's a wedding feast in Canaan, but we run out of wine. But that's no problem. We've got a celebration because Jesus is coming to this world. We're going to celebrate forever. We've got the good stuff. But Jesus doesn't believe in all of them that say that they believe because they won't come out of the light or come out of the darkness and into the light. Because here's the verdict. You love darkness more than you love light. Live as the children of light. But anyone who believes in Jesus Christ will not perish but have everlasting life. So John chapter 4, there's an opportunity to go to Samaria. Oh, the Great Commission, Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. But the, the, the apostles that don't see this as an opportunity. We don't want to go talk to those people. But Jesus hurries to get there so that he can catch this. Uh, I don't want to say adulterous woman. I almost said it because that's not necessarily true. This woman who had many husbands. Okay? Don't put other words in there that's not. Because he loved her and wanted to bring the word of gospel to her. And while they were worried about food, physical food, Jesus was worried about spiritual food and living water rather than his own water for his own nourishment. And he tells the woman that he is the Messiah. And she goes back and tells the town people and they come and see for themselves and they believe based on their testimony. And the disciples get to reap what they did not sow. Did you catch all those things from John chapter 4? <clears throat> John chapter 5, a paralyzed man is healed so that he can walk, so that he can get up his mat and walk, so that he can do something. Because if you've been healed, it's so that you can do something. Have you experienced the healing of Jesus Christ in your life? Have you been saved from death? Then you need to be his disciple, follow in his footsteps and tell others. Living as an ambassador, as though you're living in a foreign land. That this is as though God were making his reconciliation through you. Jesus says to the man, if you look at the words in red, see, you are well again, so stop sinning or something worse may happen. My father is always at his work to this very day, and I am too working. That's Jesus' next words. goes on to say in verse 23 that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. They are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me and have life. If you're going to do the work of Jesus, if you have life in the first place, you, you need to be a child of light. But don't you need to eat and be nourished? Don't you need to grow from being born again to maturity? 
I, I'm putting all this together and trying to summarize. So then you, you, see, you see that Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because of the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. This is John chapter 6. The crowds came to Jesus. They want what Jesus had to offer. No, they didn't. They wanted physical. They didn't want spiritual because spiritual means I've got to give up something so you think. Do not work, Jesus says, for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him God the Father has placed His seal of approval. Verse 28, then they asked Him, What must we do the works, what must we do to do the works God requires? Kind of like the answer, what must I, the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? Jesus' answer, the work of God is this, to go do this, to go do that. To, no, it's to believe. To believe. Because if you have faith, you're saved. And if you have faith, it will move you to do other things for the kingdom. To believe in the one who has sent you, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He goes on to say this in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Did you ever put up the sermon title? It's flesh and blood. I was waiting to hear to tell you this. Because you'd be like, what's flesh and blood mean? Because Jesus literally tells us to, if we want to mature as a Christian, to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And some of the people there that day literally thought he was talking about being a cannibal. But if you're going to live, you've got to have nourishment. I am the bread of life. Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. None, not some, none. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I remain in them. What a promise. But as we read that day, many, catch the word, disciples abandoned Jesus. They turned back and left Him that day. Because they said this was too hard. We didn't sign up for this. Yes, you did. If you signed up as a disciple, and that's why I constantly say a disciple rather than a believer, because Jesus said if anyone wants to be His disciple, to come after Him, they have to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after me. He says, anyone wants to be their, my disciple, they don't even have a place to lay their head. If you signed on to be a disciple, you know what you signed up for. And if you teach Christianity any other way, you're teaching a false gospel. Because you're supposed to train up disciples and teach them to obey everything that Jesus taught. That's why I'm a stickler on those words being left out. Many disciples turned away that day, but Simon Peter answered him, and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Well, perfect that we end there. Because God is sovereign in everything else. Because Cameron has made a profession of faith. He's gone through a lot of trials and turmoils in his life. He is seeking guidance. He needs it from his Christian family, from his physical family that are Christians and his Christian family. He needs a guidance so that he doesn't fall away because we fight this spiritual battle. And he has come to me previously, and I'm so glad we're doing it today because it all falls together, to make a public profession of faith. And the children did today. They started last week doing their uh, alphabet again because it kind of got laid by the side with some things that happened. And they did A last week. I don't remember Adam and Ark. Oh, yes, because Adam was the man who sinned, and the Ark is God's way of showing salvation through one man, and B is for believe and baptism. That's what they went to over today. I don't know how far they got because they're children. <laughs> but if you believe and profess Jesus Christ as Lord, not just as Savior again, not just I want salvation, but I've signed up to be His all His, wholeheartedly, everything, loving God with everything I have and loving others, then you make a public profession of faith by being baptized. And the way we baptize, and I'm not condemning any other baptism, is we submerge because that's the biblical example that we have. So we're going to submerge Cameron right out there, baptize him in some cold water. <laughs> because he is a new creation in Christ. Jesus Christ has totally covered him through and through, inside and out. 
He is not the same. He is born again. He is buried with Jesus in his death and raised with Jesus in his resurrection to eternal life. And he is making a public profession of faith to do that today. So I am going to close with prayer here. We're going to go out and watch him be baptized, and then we're going to come back and sing our final songs and everything. Okay? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for this family, Lord, that you have blessed us with. You are God so worthy of glory, praise, honor, that we fail to give you so much. Lord, forgive us and help us to train up our children. Oh, what a blessing it is to see our children making a profession of faith. May we be serious about our commitment to raising them, serious about our commitment to continue to walk by faith with them, praying fervently and believing, Lord, increase our faith. Help us to be the light that we need, not only to our family, but to all that we encounter, even our enemies, as Christ loved us as enemies and died for us. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So, Steve, if you'll help me, everybody go outside. We're going to baptize this young man.